Hello, Terraformers. It's me, the creation deity known as Antonio D'Amico. This is Pointy Hat, and welcome to... Tip of the Hat. The show where I summon a D&D thing for the collective unconscious of the D&D community that people need help understanding or executing. I look at it, book it with a stick a little to see if it moves, and then launch into how to best go about dealing with it. And the thing I picked today is pretty big, so strap in. We're talking about how to build worlds. So you have learned what D&D is, and now you want to make your own world to play in. Maybe you were the sort of kid that used to read a bunch and doesn't anymore. Maybe you gravitated to a fantasy world since you could string two thoughts together. Maybe you've always wanted to write a novel set in a strange and magical world, but it was just way too much work and you lost Steam 5 chapters in. And now this D&D thing comes along and suddenly the prospect of creating a whole world and actually getting to see stories unravel in it feels that much more real and possible. And you're ready to start world building. Did, did I get it right? You owe me a cookie if I did. I guess right, because that was me. And now after many, many failed attempts at world building and some actually successful ones, I'm here to try and help you through the godly and holy task of figuring out how f***ed up your elves look in your very own setting by telling you how to go about it. But talk is cheap, so how about I build an entire fantasy world as I go through my method with you in this very video to showcase exactly how it works. Sounds like fun. So let's go. We're gonna be concentrating first and foremost on the big picture stuff here. The building blocks upon which super specific world building will take place down the line. We'll talk nations, but don't expect advice on how to build cities, or factions, or specific NPCs. This video is already long and thick enough that I don't want to lose you by showering you with a rattling gun of information. But let me know if you would like more world building focused videos. We could do one about cities, one super specifically centered on nations, I don't know. Depends on how well this video does, I guess, and if y'all go feral in the comments for that. So, for now, we're going bird's eye view and broad strokes. And we're gonna do that through a numbered list. Oh boy, here comes the list. That's right, it's your favorite thing. People on YouTube saying number one. So, number one, give it a conflict. We've talked before about how a compelling player character needs conflict. Go check out my video on how to build characters to learn more. But what if I told you that conflict is extremely important, not just for your characters, but also for your world? Well, that's... That's what I'm telling you now. Conflict is what creates stories, and giving your world a conflict is the easiest and most natural way to derive plot from your world. Otherwise, characters might as well just be hanging out in a fantasy theme park where not much is happening at all. So how do we generate this conflict? Well, since we're speaking of conflict, let's talk war for a second. Two nations have been locked in a conflict that has been going on for centuries now. Immediately, you might think that this sounds senseless, but both nations are fighting for something worth fighting for. A magical artifact that would allow them to bring imagination to life. Anything they can think of, this arcane relic can create. It can summon mountains and rivers using thought alone. Incredible weapons of great magical power. And not just inanimate objects, but full living people, summoned from the imagination of whoever holds this impossibly powerful artifact. Which nation would you help acquire the artifact? Or would you rather acquire it for yourself? Well, guess what? You can right now, because this is not a fantasy world, and I'm talking about World Anvil. Literally the best possible sponsor for this video. I couldn't be happier. World Anvil is an extremely powerful world building tool. Where are you going to keep track of everything you build while you world build? Well, this thing has the word world in the title, and it's also literally made for this. World Anvil allows you to easily track every piece of information you come up with for your world. From nations, to factions, to specific NPCs, everything. And I do mean everything. Digital GM screen, campaign manager for like 45 plus systems, including character sheets, and actual writing software for your novel if you're more of an author than a DM, or both, interactive maps, family trees, a timeline to keep your world's history at your fingertips, and it also allows you to share all of this with your players in the shape of wiki articles and more, and even hide secrets from them within those articles for your devious DM plans. So if all of this world building talk has gotten you excited to start your own world, and you're looking for a way to make the process smooth as butter, you can use my code POINTYHAT, all one word, POINTYHAT, to get 51% off any yearly subscription. That's, that's more than half off, so that sounds pretty good. Link below if that sounds like a sweet deal to you. And now, let's go back to talking about conflict in world building. 
I'm gonna divide conflict in world building in two schools because I feel like it. The first school is the school of instability. Conflict in a world built through the school of instability arises from a change in the status quo in which the world operates. Sauron is rising and amassing an army and the status quo of Hobbit cottagecore bliss and elves doing absolutely nothing as they hang out in their Arduo buildings is at jeopardy. War, a changing government, the death of a key political figure, an evil ritual, an asteroid that will kill all dinosaurs and also people, but especially dinosaurs. All of those are examples of conflicts of this school. A conflict that threatens the status quo. This works when the status quo in question is easily understood by the audience, or in your case, your players. Tolkien-esque fantasy has become such a baseline at this point that if you're going for it, your world is more likely than not familiar enough to the audience that you can get away with this. The second school is the school of unfamiliarity. Conflict in this school arises from how unfamiliar the audience is with your setting, or your players. In the Hunger Games, the country of Panem went through some sort of climate slash nuclear catastrophe, changing its geography completely and giving rise to an extremely authoritarian government that quells rebellions by rounding up kids each year for... Um, um how do I say this without Mr. YouTube getting mad at me? Uh, televised arena fight where said kids have at it in Minecraft. Okay, that's an extremely alien setting. Alien enough that I had to explain it to y'all. I couldn't just summarize it as fantasy or sci-fi. Conflict in that world arises from how strange and how deadly the status quo is, not by said status quo being threatened. Kid-themed arena fights are the status quo in that world. And then, in subsequent books, once the audience understands and is familiar with the world, the conflict in the world goes from the school of unfamiliarity to the school of instability as rebellion in that world happens. You get it? Whichever you choose is up to you. But I think the school of unfamiliarity inherently leads you to build weirder worlds. So I want to use that for our world I'll be building throughout this video. So what do we take for granted in our world that, if change, would make a world instantly unfamiliar and extremely different from ours? Well, how about turning? That's right, what if the source of conflict, the thing that makes this world so deeply unfamiliar, is the fact that this was once your average D&D fantasy setting world that suddenly stopped turning around the sun, plunging one side of this world in eternal night. This one change instantly makes it so that this world now operates in a completely different way from ours, especially because we're gonna use the fact that this world stopped spinning as the source of the next world building ingredient. Threat. And speaking of, number two, give it a threat. So this is a very broad category on purpose. Since world building can go in many directions, it depends a lot on your prior choices. If you choose instability as your source of conflict, the threat is more likely than not whatever caused the instability. War itself can be a threat. The evil wizard apostrophe hyphen name can be a threat. What matters is that the threat is tied to the conflict and even more importantly, threatens your players. The vampire Count Strahd is a threat in the seminal D&D 5th edition setting, Stephanie Meyer's Midnight Sun, because he messes with the players constantly. This is very similar to my advice on making your villains active, and one of the reasons to do so is because players have to feel the threat of the world. But what if you did like the example of the world we're building now in this video and chose unfamiliarity as a source of conflict? Well, the threat needs to come from how the world operates itself. Something about how this world functions makes it inherently threatening to your players. And what's cool about unfamiliarity is that this can be anything. So how about we continue that example to see what I mean? So, the stillness happened and our world stopped turning for undetermined reasons, plunging one side in unending night. What if the threat was night itself? When the world stopped, something stirred in the shadows. Shadows themselves. A completely new type of monster that is both attracted to and weak to light. They can somehow perceive the inherent light shed by the soul of all living things and crave it as it's the only light that doesn't hurt them. When someone falls to one of these shadowy beings, they are afflicted with a condition called penumbral syndrome, most commonly referred to by non-nerds that don't spend their time in Cleric MD as the gloom. Too much gloom and you, yourself, turn into a silhouette, a shadow of who you once were. A sort of shadow caricature that seeks to absorb the light in the soul of other living beings just like yours was absorbed too. Faced with this threat, people build cities around arcane artificial suns to stave off the night and protect themselves from the silhouettes that lurk within. Okay, that's pretty sick. This threat is very much a real threat. I love zombie-esque threats that aren't actual zombies. That means a threat that turns you into what it is, and by making it something directly tied to the conflict of this world, the stillness, the fact that it stopped turning, our threat feels like a logical product of what makes this world unique. And come on, Gaslamp Fantasy D&D? Cities built around artificial suns? Seeing your beloved NPC or hell, your PC turn into this monster that feels like a cruel approximation of who they once were? I mean, I'm already excited about that, so let's keep it up with our next number. Number three, give it a goal. 
Okay, up until now, you could have very much used this guy to write any world, like for a book or something, but this is where we get into specifically TTRPG territory. I am a massive, massive fan of worlds that are built with a quest in mind, where the setup for the world itself leads you on a quest. The way in which the world operates not only generates conflict, but it generates something for your players to do. This doesn't mean that this setup cannot work with other types of fiction, other than playing pretend with your friends for 6 hours, even if all of you are either 30 or pushing 30. In fact, my favorite example of this is not from TTRPGs at all. The world of One Piece is made to go on a quest to the eponymous One Piece. It's extremely TTRPG friendly in its world building. Former King of the Pirates hides a big mysterious treasure that can only be found after going through an extremely specific gauntlet that is literally built by the geography of the world. You can only reach the treasure if you specifically go through the equator while hitting some specific islands in a specific order. Of course, you could run anything in that world, but the fact that the world gives you a goal around which to make a plot that the world is literally built to facilitate is so sick. Caveat though, this only works if the goal itself is pretty broad. Get to a place, defeat the guy, find the thing. Overcomplicating it will create a world that feels like it was built to railroad rather than to offer a goal to strive for. And making alternative quests that don't have that for a goal will feel like you're literally going against the world rather than existing within it. So what does that mean for us and our little eternal night world? Well, what if instead of finding a treasure, we made it so that the goal is to get somewhere? And what a better somewhere than the other side of the world. That's right, if half the world is plunged in eternal darkness, the other side must be plunged in light. Although nobody has ever been able to actually manage to reach it ever since the world stopped moving. Shadows grow thick and extremely deadly the closer you get towards the horizon line. It's always darkest before the dawn, as they say. Teleportation and scrying magic seem to not work when targeting the other side, as if the shadows were literally barring people from passing or seeing through the wall of shadow at the horizon. But this hasn't stopped people from imagining what is on the other side of the horizon. Line. Some say that the only cure to the penundral syndrome is to be bathed in the direct light of the sun. Others say that civilization has flourished on the light side of the world without the threat of becoming a silhouette with untold riches and magical knowledge. While some believe that beings made of light besiege those living in the light side of the world just as the shadows do on the side of eternal night, and there is no hope in sight. However, the most well-known rumor is that the key to restoring the world back to its normal state resides in the light side itself. Reaching the side of eternal daylight. That's a pretty clear and at the same time broad goal for our world. Tell me you can't instantly think of reasons why a character would undertake this journey. Chasing the horizon line. Maybe they have been afflicted by the gloom, and they are on borrowed time until they are overtaken by the shadow and become a silhouette themselves. Maybe they're one of the keepers of the city's artificial sun, and it has been malfunctioning, so they're going to the other side to find a way to fix it. So many possible character motivations can come from this goal, and the reason why is because we are not gonna define what is on the other side of the world. By leaving it vague, everyone telling stories in this world can decide for themselves what is actually on the other side. Better yet, they can create an infinite number of legends that would lead a character to chase the horizon line. And also, by leaving it up in the air, we ensure that no player actually knows what is on the other side. It will be a surprise to all that play depending on what the DM decides. That's cool. Okay, so that is our numbered list, but I tricked you. Those three steps were the preliminary steps to get into the actual meat of world building. What? I said I would help you world build, not that it would be easy. Come on, get up. We gotta talk about causality. So what do I mean with causality? Well, if you've been following along with this guide, we've established the broader strokes under which our world operates. Now, it's time to use those strokes to decide how they have changed the world itself and those that live in it. Causality, baby. As I said, we're keeping it to a bird's eye view here. If I went to, I don't know, agricultural exports or even something as relatively broad as cities, we'll be here all day. There's always a possibility of more world building videos based on if y'all like this one and it does well, so hit the bell icon, subscribe, feed the algorithmical god with a comment and a like. For now, we're sticking with the big picture. Starting with, that's right, another numbered list. Oh, wait, that's confusing. I can't use numbers again. Number A, nations. I find it easiest to start with nations rather than the people living in them. But you can do whatever, it's your world, but this is my video, so listen up. The trick to making this world of yours, and of mine, and of ours, to feel unique is, as I said, causality. 
you should always be asking yourself what characteristics of your world led to a certain thing to be the way that it is in your world. Since in this little gas lamp fantasy world we we're building, there was a massive calamity, we can very much take that as a springboard to make everything in our world feel like a natural conclusion of that. What happened to the nations of this world and their values when the world stopped spinning and the shadows turned hostile? I happen to think that this is easier to do with examples, so let's get right into that. For our first nation, I want to concentrate on the arcane artificial suns, since it was the thing that allowed people to actually survive. What about the nation that first discovered the magical formulas and spells that allowed them to create these artificial suns? I imagine that they would put a massive emphasis on magic, and not just on magic, but on learning in general. They would see knowledge and academic prowess as what literally saved them from extinction. I am a massive fan of using actual history in my world building, rather than just vomiting what other media has already used before. So what about enlightened despotism? I know, I know, big words. This is basically a mode of government that is very much not a democracy, or not a true one, it is for the people without the people. Enlightened despotists believe that the masses just won't choose in their best interest. They don't have the critical thinking skills to know, much less to choose, what is best for them. What if we combine this with the idea of putting academia and the academic pursuit of knowledge on a pedestal? This nation survived by coming up with an insanely powerful arcane artificial sun, and ever since, they have created a system of government where academia is king, and only those considered enlightened enough are true citizens. Everyone in this region goes through rigorous cooling, and then, at 18 years of age, they undertake a massive test. Those that pass, commonly referred to as brights, are full citizens who go on to pursue higher education and, more importantly, get to vote on who rules them. Those that don't pass, on the other hand, are called dims, and they can own businesses and land, but are not seen by their government as capable of governing themselves. They don't have access to higher education and can't vote. This is not done out of malice, but out of an extremely patriotic view in a region that sees academic accomplishments as the most important thing a person can do, and the reason why they survived the calamity that befell the world. See? Instantly flavorful, instantly connected to the setting, and has that good good causality I was talking about. I'm imagining massive city-wide universities where everything is set up to facilitate the lives of students. Everything looks like sort of baroque library, light academia as opposed to dark academia, if you will. Let's make more! For our second nation, what of a country that survived not by academic prowess, but by ingenuity and engineering? They didn't come up with the arcane formulas to create the artificial suns that saved them, but came up with a technological artificery that allowed them to stabilize the artificial sun and reduce the strain it causes on the weave to have the brightest light bulb in existence running 24-7. This nation saw engineering, technology, and industry save their lives. So how about complete pragmatists? Culturally, your worth is tied to what you're able to bring to the table. What do you do successfully? Quickly. You can be an artist, but you better be successful enough to provide something of value to others. You will never be as important as an engineer or an artificer. Your worth here has to be tangible. What can you produce? Very late stage capitalism vibes. Love it. Just kidding, of course I don't love it, but for those of you who are too thick to understand this, the point here is not to make utopia, guys. It's to make interesting places to set stories in. If I see one comment chastising me for putting late stage capitalism in my world because it's bad, I will banish you to the Nightlands. Anyway, let's take this obsession with industry to government. Oligarchy. These people took the medieval system of guilds and made it a mode of government. If you're good enough at creating and selling your product, you are now part of a guild. And if you are at the top of your guild, you are a guild leader. And all guild leaders meet at the guild hall where they govern the nation. The leaders of each guild are literally those that have amassed the biggest fortunes. Because in this results first pragmatic view of life, those are the ones that succeeded. And therefore, they should be the ones to lead. I'm imagining a 19th century industrial revolution architecture. Iron rod fences, metallic beams holding glass domes. Beautiful buildings here are made of exposed brick laid in beautiful patterns. Everything looks like an industrial train station. These people are in love with industry and their cities look like beautiful arcane factories. Okay, so everybody knows that three is a magic number, so let's make our last one. If the first one survived thanks to academia, and the second one thanks to their industry, how about a nation that survived thanks to their military prowess? How about a nation that embraced the military as a way of governance because the military saved them from certain extinction by making a human wall around those that were hastily creating an artificial sun to protect them from shadows. A literal wall of soldiers as this nation's last line of defense, and the only reason it survived. I can see those that did survive readily accepting military rule as the way to survive in this new world. Imagine a country ruled entirely like every person in it is a member of the military. 
They all get schooling and soldier training specifically, but an army marches on its belly. Many are soldiers, but others are cooks, doctors, teachers, except all of them could take up arms at any moment. And what if that is actually their main export? A nation of military mercenaries. Need help in a conflict? In a war? They'll lend you the services of their soldiers, who are trained from birth to take up arms and fight. But I am the last person to make a military apologia nation. So what twist can we give to this to make it a tad more interesting? Well, one of the biggest things the military trains you to do is to dehumanize the enemy. So what does that look like on a nationwide scale? What if the citizens of this nation are trained to see all other people as an other, an alien? That's pretty hard to do in real life since we all look relatively alike, but that's not the case in D&D. What if most people in this nation are of a race that looks particularly alien, very different from all the other races in D&D? What if they were dragonborn? That's right, I don't want to hear more crying about how I hate dragons. I still do, but I'm mature enough to not let that influence my world building. Please use the word brave in the comments to talk about my ability to get over dragon hate. Imagine a nation of dragonborn that have literally never seen another humanoid. Imagine how easy it would be for their government to train them to dehumanize others in a conflict. That's dark, and it's cool. But what if we push it further? What if people of other D&D races could join this nationwide military, but in order to do so, they had to agree to wear dragon masks that obscure their faces to help the native dragonborn population from humanizing other races? We could go even further in the world building here. What if they raise their children communally, allowing them to reproduce quickly and to have specialized roles in their society to raise and indoctrinate children in their way of life? What if they magically made it so that all dragonborn children are born with the same color scales, and in their society, your scale color dictates your military rank, and as you rise in the ranks, your scales are changed to a different color, including the scales on your dragon mask if you're not a dragonborn. Okay, I must admit, even a dragon hater like me loves this. And that's how you build nations with causality. As you can see, we are using what we established on our first number list to create them. The point here is to tie everything together, to make every part of your world feel like it has a reason to be the way that it is. Use what you came away with from the first three points to build everything else. Causality, people. Okay, moving on to the last point on our numbered list. Bumblebee races. One of the most fun parts of any D&D setting is getting to decide how your bread and butter races have a different culture and a place in the world in this new setting. Give them a twist, if you will. And since we already have Dragonborn down, let's figure out some other ones. Let's start with everyone's favorite, elves. Everyone but me, I find them boring. So let's make them interesting. There are 17,000 of these and I don't want that at all. So let's limit it to the big three, high elves, wood elves, and edgy elves. High Elves are known for being snooty, but also for their magical talents. So how about they were already pretty big in our academic city, and most of those that figured out the arcane formulas to create the artificial suns were High Elves. I think being the literal saviors of this world would go to their head majorly and instantly, which is what makes them interesting. After the stillness took place and the artificial suns were the only thing that allowed cities to prosper, High Elves came to see themselves as the world's saviors, but also entitled to the light of their creation. They shared their formula for arcane suns with the rest of the world, but only if they agreed that all high elves would have a place under the sunlight if they came to any city that used their suns. I imagine cities would be structured completely different in this world, where the center of them, the place where the sun shines directly below, the zenith of the city, if you will, because we love making little fantasy terms for stuff, this zenith being a mix of extremely rich people and agriculture, whereas for us, agriculture is left to only the edges of settlements. High elves literally have the right to arrive to any city and demand to be lodged at its center. Prime real estate be damned. In fact, let's push this further. What if there are high elves out there that claim they have the opposite of the drow's sunlight sensitivity? Night sensitivity. They say they must constantly be bathed in sunlight to survive. What if your high elf PC was raised believing this when it's a lie? What if they reject their parents once they learn this? That's cool and generates conflict and gives you enough to both make great NPCs for players and make your own characters. Okay, we gotta figure out Drow and the Underdark races. What if the Underdark became completely uninhabitable because of how hard it is to light a cave? Arcane Suns here would be extremely ineffectual, since the cave walls constantly cast shadows that silhouettes could always use to hide in and attack. Underground races were forced out of the bowels of the earth and into the night sky, but they thrived like they never did before on the surface because of the constant darkness. Since they're literally adapted to low light environments and do better in them, drow are the archetypal adventurers in this world and often find themselves as couriers or travelers of all stripes, but there's a resentment there. The surface world accepts them now, 
but they can't help but see that this is only because they are useful to them now, when they were scorned before. Okay, cool. Wood elves next. They're all about living in the wilderness, not making settlements, and just hanging out on trees. At the same time, I imagine the creation of artificial suns as an extremely costly and magic-draining undertaking. Not everything can get an artificial sun. Only major settlements would be able to afford the undertaking of creating one. So when Wood Elves requested that their forest, empty of population besides the handful of elves that made it their home, be given artificial suns, they were quickly denied. And for understandable reasons. Wood Elves did not see it this way, however. They saw how civilization refused to save and protect nature once more, how their sacred forest homes were twisted by night into an unrecognizable dark mirror of what they once were, and grew incredibly resentful. Some decided to abandon the forest and live amongst other races, but many didn't. Most died while trying to live in the dark at the hands of shadows, until they found a way to dim the light shed by their souls, making them harder to detect by the silhouettes hunting any sentient creature in the dark. This, however, had the unfortunate side effect of dulling their emotions. Their resentment was the only emotion that remained just as strong as it was when the forest were left to die. They now live in extremely small communities, as the more people present in a settlement, the more light is shed by their collective souls, and will absolutely refuse to help anyone that somehow found their way into the woods. Actively using the light shed by travelers as a diversion to direct silhouettes to the travelers and away from their settlements. If you're caught by shadows in the forest, you might see the reflective eyes of wood elves staring at you from the branches as you are besieged by silhouettes, watching silently as the shadows end your life, refusing to help you as a twisted form of payback for letting their forest come to ruin. No, those are some elves I can get behind. No, no, not like that, you freaks. I could stay here all day world building the lore of each race and defining how they were changed by the stillness ends becoming as crucial as hospitals in society and the halflings running them taking that opportunity to become mafiosos. Orcs and goblins initially allowed in cities to be used as cannon fodder against shadows but then becoming integral members and outright manning and controlling the military and guard of the cities. Hell, why not some new races? Moth people race. <laughs> the f*** is that? <laughs> Meeple. D&D Mothman. Maybe they're sort of Asimar-like, sent by a moon god when the world stopped turning to guide people through the night. What about a robotic race of constructs that have a candle in their chassis made out of the soul of a person, built to travel the night and only retaining vague memories of who they once were in life? The possibilities are endless, but this video is already ungodly long. 30 minutes long, in fact. Please clap, like, comment, and subscribe, and all that. This was a lot of work, so let's bring it back to our method. The point of this method is to define the massive broad strokes and then apply them to everything you build afterwards to make the world feel like a natural conclusion to the building blocks you laid out first. You can take this world building method to everything, not just nations or races, but everything in your setting to make it feel like your broad strokes truly created a completely unique world. What are the gods of this setting? It seems like light worship would be massive here. What if the main religion was once sun worship to a sun god, but the religion has fallen out of favor for moon worship now, as the moon is the only thing that lights up the sky anymore? What if the moon god had different aspects depending if it was waning or waxing? What would be the relationship between the two gods? There's so much else to do. A shame we just have to abandon it. Or do we? That's right, I tricked you all once again. You were blind to my dastardly schemes. Unless you are one of the hundreds that watches my stream. I didn't trick you guys, didn't I? That's right, this whole example world is one I have been actively building. And a whole bunch of my audience has had a direct hand in it. I've been world building this entire world on stream. And it's been... I cannot even fathom the amount of people that watched the streams. Real talk, I didn't even know if the streams would work, so I decided to start them on a platform I had no audience in and I didn't care that much about, thinking it would be just a small number of people, and then <laughs> it wasn't at all. <laughs> so I'm bringing it here to the main channel because people seem to love it. That's right, listen up everyone. I will be streaming here on YouTube tomorrow. I'll continue to build on the example world of this video, and you can contribute to that in chat! Every Sunday at 5pm EST, 2pm PDT, 10pm GMT plus 1, starting tomorrow, you can catch the stream where we will make countries, cities, NPCs, monsters, spells, everything about this world that I have presented to you in this video, and you'll be able to influence all these decisions. Just by watching this video, you're already caught up. So you can just show up this Sunday to the stream and join me. Well, me, my human familiar.
in world building. If you can't join me this Sunday, don't worry, because I have created a whole new channel just for live streams. That's right, if you go to the description, you will find Pony Hat Live, the place where I'll be putting all our past streams and recaps that will let you catch up to where the stream is currently in like minutes. Just in case you don't feel like watching three hours of streaming to figure out what sort of weird looking guys we are making on stream. I know many of you don't want to have this channel inundated by weekly reruns of live streams, so those will be living in Pony Hat Live, don't worry. But you won't get to join on the stream and talk with me and vote in chat to give your opinion if you don't come to the stream. And the streams will be happening here in the Pointy Hat main channel. So if that sounds like fun, you should find a notification to tomorrow's stream right on your subscription box right now. You can click the bell on that live stream to be reminded once the live stream is about to start so you don't miss it. As I said, I cannot believe the reception that this world building stream has gotten, especially because it's not like it's a common format for streaming or anything. I don't think people have done this before and y'all loved it and showed up for it and hang out with me in my human familiar form every week. And that's sweet of you. I couldn't be more thankful for that. So, okay, I'm off to plan the next stream. Anyway, see you there. Hopefully, if you feel like it, hope you do feel like that. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye. Mwah.